Good morning. I realize that there are probably some of you who are watching these YouTube videos who are not receiving emails from me during the week. Um, each Friday I try to send out the lessons for the coming Sunday um, and some other worship resources. So if you're not getting those emails, uh, please contact the church and leave an email address for me and I'll see that you get added to the distribution list. We'll begin worship this morning with confession and forgiveness in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. O oh God, you direct our lives by your grace, and your words of justice and mercy reshape the world. Mold us into a people who welcome your word and serve one another through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. A reading from Jeremiah chapter 28. The prophet Jeremiah spoke to the prophet Hananiah in the presence of the priests and all the people who were standing in the house of the Lord. The prophet Jeremiah said, Amen. May the Lord do so. May the Lord fulfill the words that you have prophesied and bring back to this place from Babylon the vessels of the house of the Lord and all the exiles. But listen now to this word that I speak in your hearing and the hearing of all the people. The prophets who preceded you and me from ancient times prophesied war, famine, and pestilence against many countries and great kingdoms. As for the prophet who prophesies peace, when the word of that prophet comes true, then it will be known that the Lord has truly sent the prophet. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from Romans chapter 6. Do not let sin exercise dominion in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. No longer present your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and present your members to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Should we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one to whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? 
But thanks be to God that you, having once been slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the form of teaching to which you were entrusted, and that you, having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to greater and greater inequity, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness for sanctification. When you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. So what advantage do you get from the things of which you are now ashamed? The end of those things is death. But now that you have been freed from sin and enslaved to God, the advantage you get is sanctification. The end is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to the twelve, Whoever welcomes you welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. If you've been paying attention to the gospel readings these last couple of weeks, you might be starting to wonder why in the world anyone would want to follow Jesus. The first 12 disciples, after all, have been kind of having a rough go of it of late. Or maybe more accurately, Jesus has been warning them about the hard times to come as he prepares to send them out into the world as sheep among wolves. A couple of weeks ago, you might recall, Jesus told them that they were to take nothing for their journey and that they should be ready to shake the dust off their feet when people reject them and they had the doors slammed in their faces. He also said that they should expect to be flogged and betrayed, maligned and persecuted for no other reason than the fact that they are simply Jesus' disciples. And then last week, we heard Jesus tell the twelve that rather than peace, he had come wielding a sword, a sword that would divide families in two, and that it would only be by losing one's life for Jesus' sake that the disciples would find life. It's almost as if Jesus had asked his disciples if they wanted to hear the good news or the bad news first. And the disciples must have clearly said, give us the bad news, because clearly the picture that Jesus has been painting has not been a rosy one. Thankfully, today, though, Jesus at last gives his apostles some more encouraging news the tone of today's reading becomes a little more optimistic. Because while those whom Jesus sends out to the world will still face suffering and rejection and persecution, Jesus today assures them as well that there will also be those who will open their doors to the apostles and who will welcome them people who will, amidst all of the disciples' struggles and heartaches, 
provide them with a place of some sanctuary. And who, in so doing, will make it possible for them to carry out and persevere in the work of the kingdom that Jesus has given them to do. That good news that Jesus shares today, though, is not just for the twelve. It's not just for Jesus' little inner circle. The good news in today's gospel is for all those who will come after them, after the twelve. For future generations who will be sent out into the world to cure what ails people, to raise people from death-dealing ways to life, to cast out demons in whatever form they might take that plague people yet today as a testimony to the fact that the kingdom of heaven has and is still coming near. Sent out into an unwelcoming world today, Jesus' present-day apostles will also face persecution and hardship, but they too will encounter those who are receptive to God's kingdom and who, through even the simplest acts of hospitality, will contribute to that kingdom's spread. And even more than being for those 12 apostles whose names are known to us, even more than for those in our day who are out there on the front lines doing Jesus' work, I think that the good news of today's gospel is even more is primarily intended for those who typically are not known by name. And for those who work quietly often behind the scenes, who do the welcoming, those who do what sometimes seems like inconsequential things, like opening a door or sharing a cup of cold water. The promises that Jesus makes in today's gospel, after all, are directed first and foremost to those whom Jesus calls repeatedly the whoever's. The whoever's that merely welcome apostles or prophets or righteous people or even the little ones, those nameless followers of Jesus, simply they belong to Jesus, those whoever's will welcome Jesus and the one who sent him as well. The whoever's, the nameless ones who simply offer a cup of cold water to a little one, a run-of-the-mill disciple, they are doing the work of the kingdom and will share in its rewards as well. Not everyone, after all, has been called to hit the road for Jesus. Some are called to stay home and to open their doors. Not all are called to be prophets or pastors or deacons or missionaries. Not everyone is suited to be a social activist or reformer. The Spirit calls, uh, calls and equips us all differently. But Jesus promises that even the whoever's, those who simply offer welcome, and encouragement and support. The whoever's who simply have the backs of those in more public ministries, the whoever's are no less significant in the kingdom of heaven. 
For decades, congregations have measured success by the number of programs that they have offered. And I think, unfortunately, they have often undervalued simple hospitality. One of the gifts that I think is being offered to the church by the generation that follows my own is a renewed call for congregations to be more hospitable, more relational. Some younger adults over the years recently have told me that they have been programmed to death and that what they long for from a congregation is simply a community, a place that will welcome them in and support them in whatever their calling is. Being hospitable just opening the door and being kind to others and being supportive. It's not glamorous work. And neither is it particularly hard. Whoever can do it. But it is no less the work of the kingdom. To its recipients, it is like a cup of cold water. And even the whoever's, Jesus assures us, the often unnamed and unrecognized, those who offer such a simple gift, that of welcome, that of hospitality, they offer that gift to Jesus himself and will in no way lose their reward. We confess our common faith, the faith in which we were baptized. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Called into unity with one another and the whole creation, let us pray for our shared world. God of companionship, encourage our relationships with our siblings in Christ. Bless our conversations. Shape our shared future and give us hearts eager to join in a festal shout of praise. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. God of abundance, you make your creation thrive and grow to provide all that we need. Inspire us to care for our environment and be attuned to where the earth is crying out. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. God of mercy, your grace is poured out for all. Inspire authorities judges and politicians to act with compassion. Teach us to overcome fear with hope, to meet hate with love, and to welcome one another as we would welcome you. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. God of care, accompany all who are in deepest need. Comfort those who are sick lonely or abandoned. Strengthen those who are in prison or awaiting trial. Renew the spirits of all who call upon you. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. God of community, we give thanks for this congregation. Give us passion to embrace your mission and the vision to recognize where you are leading us. 
Teach us how to live more faithfully with each other. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of faithfulness, hear our other prayers now that we lift before you either aloud or in the silence of our hearts. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of love, you gather in your embrace all who have died, especially Scott. Keep us steadfast in our faith and renew our trust in your promise. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Receive these prayers, O God, and those too deep for words, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. God the Creator, Jesus the Christ, and the Holy Spirit the Comforter, bless and keep you in eternal love. Amen. Go in peace. Christ is with you. Thanks be to God.